I want to tell you guys a story about when I was a little boy. And I know it's hard to believe that I was little. I really wasn't little, I was just shorter. <laughs> <laughs> and for Christmas one year, I really wanted, forgive me, you in the audience, an international tractor and a red gravity flow wagon. Sorry to you John Deere lovers. That's what I wanted more than anything in the whole world for Christmas. And on Christmas, my parents got me that gift. They gave me the gift that I wanted. And we had two huge collie dogs in a pen. And our job was to feed and water the dogs. And I complained and threw a fit. And why do I have to feed the dogs? Now, my parents gave me this wonderful gift. And I didn't show any gratitude, did I? I really should have been more than happy to do as my parents asked because of the great gift they gave me, shouldn't I have been? Yeah. So today, in our gospel reading, God gives us a command. He tells us to go into the world and to share the story of Jesus Christ with everyone. He tells us to teach everybody to follow his commands. Why should we follow God's commands? Well, that of gratitude, because he gave us his son, the greatest gift in the world, isn't it? Because it lasts for eternity. So that we need to not ask the question, what's in it for me? We need to ask the question, or we need to not ask, and just obey God obediently, don't we? As well as our parents, right? And nobody's shaking their head. <laughs> but we do. <laughs> All right, you guys can go back and sit down. Our gospel reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you till the end of the age. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. So I've got to ask, how's your going going? Is that not the theme of our congregation hung above our door? It comes from this passage. For those who aren't familiar with how we do things around here, we, we uh, follow what they call a lectionary. It's a three-year cycle throughout the Bible. And it's an Old Testament reading, a psalm, a New Testament epistle, and a gospel. So there's four readings. And they all come together. They all uh, co-mingle. They all follow the same theme. And today, and of course, it follows the calendar of the church year and the festivals that we celebrate. And today we're celebrating the Holy Trinity. So all of our readings today have to do with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So i got to ask, what does Genesis, the creation story, have to do with the Trinity? What most people miss is the subtleties that come across from the Hebrew into the English there. In the beginning, God. Who created? God, the Father. What started creation? God's Spirit hovered over the waters, didn't it? The Holy Spirit. Then God said. And who is the Word of God? But Jesus Christ. The Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, had been with us from the beginning. And how do we know this? What further proof can we see in the Genesis reading? When God created man, He said, let's them create them in my image, the image of me. No. The Hebrew is plural. The literal translation is what we read today. Let us make them in our image. It's plural. God's talking about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We'll make them in our image. The Trinity has been with us from the beginning. And that is what the creation story has to do with the gospel reading today. When Jesus commissions us to go and baptize in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Well, they obeyed there. But some still doubted, didn't they? What I need to tell you is I've wrestled with this reading all week long. I've agonized over it, and it's beat the snot out of me. 
because two things keep coming to my mind as I go over this text. Discipleship and obedience. And it's convicted me, and it's made me want to give God the best that I can give him. And I've fallen short, as we all do. We're all humans. So I stand here today and I ask you to do the same thing, to think about this text. <clears throat> Jesus says, go, make disciples. What is a disciple? Mark Vanderteig the head of our denomination, and when he came to my certification interview, he asked me a question that cut me to the heart. He said, are you making disciples in that church? Or are you entertaining? It set a whole new sense of responsibility upon me to teach and to empower and to enable. That's why we do the Bible studies all throughout the summer. That's why I study four to six hours to do the Bible study. That revelation's a tough one. That's why I study to do the sermons because I want to make you guys disciples so that you can go in the world and make more disciples. Disciples are somebody who's obedient to God's command and has faith in Jesus Christ. Someone who's in the word daily, encountering their Lord on a daily basis. A disciple is someone who always looks for the right thing to do in every situation. A disciple is someone who pours themselves out for their neighbor, regardless of whether it's fair or not. A disciple worships God first and foremost. Their faith in their God is most important. What did Jesus say the greatest commandment was? Love God and love your neighbor. God is first and foremost. And it wasn't a new command. He was quoting Deuteronomy and Leviticus. This has been the command from the very beginning. God seeks to be your God and your only God. And our God is a jealous God and he's a powerful God. And if you have other gods, believe you me, he'll do away with them. Because by inflicting wrath or, inflict, or, or just simply allowing you to suffer the consequences of your wrongful choices, it forces you to run from the wrath of God or to run from the consequences of your choices, of your, of your bad choices, that is. And as you run from the consequences of your bad choices or run from the wrath of God, where do you have to run to? Nowhere but into the arms, open arms of a loving Savior. All the trials in your life, all the negative consequences are to make you aware all God's law is that you're a sinner. And it's to get you running so that you're looking for that Savior and that place to run to. And the human heart, man, it, it falls in love with all kinds of things. How many people made a decision to fall in love with their spouse? It just happens, doesn't it? It's a power beyond your control. Same way with idols. It's real easy to fall in love with big screen televisions or cell phones or, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. I'm amongst you, you know? And so you need your Lord every day in your life through his word to keep your heart bound to him and not to the distractions of the world. This is what a disciple is. A disciple who sets aside time, as Martin Luther says, every week to hear the preaching of God so that we don't hate it or forsake it. You see, Luther hated the wrath of God, but he loved the Savior. And this is what he came to the conclusion of. I run from the wrath of God, which I hate, into the harms of the Savior whom I love. Fairness has nothing to do with it. Nothing. God commands we are to follow. We don't ask what's in it for me. And in our society today, it's so easy, you know? We have an exchange. You, know, you, you give money, you get something. You give time, you, you go to work, you get a paycheck. You go to the grocery store, you give money, you get food. 
go to a movie, you give money, you get entertainment. Then you get robbed blind at the snack bar. <laughs> but this is not what God calls us to. These are relationships of the world, and they're good, and they're fine. But this is not the relationship that we're to have with our Savior. Our relationship with our Savior is complete give because He gave everything. God give all of Himself to you, holding nothing back. And it wasn't fair to Him. We at least, at the very least out of gratitude, can obey all that He's commanded. And that's what He says in here, isn't it? All authority is given to me over heaven and the earth. Jesus has all the power now in his resurrected state. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. You see, the Jews, Jesus came for the Jews. They rejected him. And their rejection of Jesus opens the salvation to the whole world. Now, it was predicted that way in the Old Testament. In Psalms and, you know, your people will reject me and I'll go to a people who will, uh, will be their God who aren't my people. It's, this was God's plan. So don't let that shock you. Baptizing them. In our study of Revelation, there's the mark upon the, the martyrs, the mark upon the redeemed, the mark upon the faithful. And through the hours of study that I've put in, I cannot come up with any other thing other than that mark being baptism. At baptism, you are sealed with the sign of the cross, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, after you pour water on you. You are marked and claimed for Jesus. That is the mark that people may not see physically on your head, but they must see in your actions and your obedience to all that God commands. Why? I thought our works didn't save us. That's right. You don't do good works and obey the commands of God to gain salvation. That's American evangelicalism. That's not scripture. You do good works because you're saved. Out of salvation comes good works. I think Dennis Smithberg said it the best. You're not a bad tree who tries to produce good fruit. You must first be made a good tree, and then you produce good fruit. In baptism, Jesus renews you and makes you a good tree. And the very least you can do is produce good fruit. Obey his commands. All that he's commanded. And repent when you fall short. Because you will. Because you're humans. The biggest we mistake we make when we go to scripture is think that if there's a should or there's an ought, there ought to be an able to. God didn't give us the law so that we are able to live up to it and earn our own righteousness. If that were the case, then we wouldn't have needed Jesus Christ. What I'm telling you is you have righteousness because of your baptism. You have righteousness. Now your good works must come. You must be obedient to God. Faith must be first and foremost the priority in your life. If it's not, there will be consequences because God wants to be your God and your God alone. And he is all powerful and he will make it happen. That's pretty scary, isn't it? That's why Martin Luther and all his explanations to the Ten Commandments and all his explanations in the Catechism, they start how? How do they start? We are to fear and love God. Every one of them starts that way. To fear and love God, so do we not neglect the preaching of his word. We're to fear and love God, so that we do not partake in sorcery and abuse of his name. We're to fear and love God, so we put our neighbor's actions in the best of light. We're to fear and love God. Fear of God is what society has lost, because they don't know the scriptures. You're to fear and love God and obey his commands. 
and then go. Go and make disciples. How do you make disciples? Verse, uh, nine, no, verse 20. Teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. How can you teach something you don't know? This is what's convicted me all week. How can you call for something that you don't know? How can you teach what you don't know? You see, we can go and tell people, well, I believe, you know, this, and I believe this, and I believe God's this way. I'm not interested in what you think. I'm interested in what you know from Scripture. You can't go and make disciples until you're yourself a disciple. Be in the Word. Get to know it so you know who God is. You know what God commands. So you can tell somebody, I know that Scripture says, da 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 Instead of, well, I really believe that God is kind of like this. It's not about feeling. It's not about reason. We stand under Scripture in this church. We stand under Scripture's authority. We don't stand over Scripture and interpret to the people. We stand under Scripture as it interprets us. And what does Scripture say about us? We're a fallen, broken race in need of a Savior from Genesis to Revelation. Story's the same. That's the story we share. But if you don't know it, you can't share it. So how's your going going? We've got plenty of opportunity in this church to reach out. We've got the county fair coming up. Man, what a great outreach that was last year. What a great outreach to be able to tell people about your faith and your faith community. You know the purpose of the church? The purpose of the church is to live together in a community through good times and bad. They're not all going to be joyful times. We live together as a community, accepting each other's brokenness through good times and bad as a witness to the world that it can be done. That it can be done. Problems can be worked through. We can get together and praise and celebrate. If one of us falls short, the rest of us will be there to help pick them up, myself included. Falling short, that is, and picking them up. This is what the family of Word of Life Lutheran Church is. This is what we need to share with folks. But we need to be disciples first. We need to get ready before we go. Reflecting upon the last five years of my life has been a five years of preparation. And I can't believe it's finally over and I'm scared to death, to be honest with you. Because there was always something more to learn, another class to take. Well, I'm not there yet, so be patient with me. Well, now I'm there. Bulletproof jacket's off, honeymoon's over. It's time to go and do. It's time to put up or shut up for me. And it's a heavy burden that I've been weighing on me, so if I've been cranky lately, forgive me, Zanny. <laughs> but it's a good thing, because it's, again, God laying on the consequences, God laying on the reality that I fall short and I have to rely totally and completely on Him to lead this congregation in a spiritual manner. The church council leads them in every other manner. I lead the congregation in spirituality, what it means to have faith, what it means to be a disciple. And I'm ready for the challenge, and I ask that you be ready as well. Come with me, because it's a great adventure. Let's do it together. I can't do it myself. We've got the county fair. We've got the how to pray for your adult children Bible study. We've got the Revelation Bible study. We've got Tuesday night service that we can reach out to those who are unchurched and not, and not used to going to church on Sunday or those who um, want a, a, an additional service, you know, that love their home church but can come here. Or we got Tuesday night for those who can't make it on Sunday morning because of other obligations the world is thrown in your way. What else do we have? We have Sunday school, VBS. Is that making disciples? You're darn right it is. The Christian education team here at Word of Life Lutheran Church is making disciples out of our youth. 
We've got VBS coming up. Can you be a mentor to a child? Can you serve in some way at VBS? Vacation Bible School? We've got the Christian outreach thing. Can you be a witness to the community? Can we come together? I'm telling you, 24 people from six different congregations came together as one unit last Sunday. We can do it. We can come together in this community as, a, as one Christian faith, one Christian witness. Oops, I'm going on, aren't I? <laughs> we can do it. We can fulfill what Jesus has commanded us to do, to go into the community and make disciples. It is absolutely, positively, my belief, I am convinced beyond reasonable doubt that our mission is to the Jefferson County area. That's what Word of Life is called to serve. We're called to make lazy pastors and other churches step up and start doing what they're supposed to be doing. We're called to come together with the other Christians and give one Christian unified witness to the Maharishis, to the world. Because the world's watching us, remember? The world is watching us. Let us pray. Almighty God and Father, we thank you so much for your commission. Father, first and foremost, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, who gives us eternal life. There is nothing greater that we can ask for. And we thank you, Father, that you've trusted us to send us into the world to keep that word and to share that word. And we ask, Father, that you give us the strength and courage to go and do as you have asked. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.